Okay, hello again and welcome. I'm Octavius Obi. My guest today is uh, Dr. C. Patrick Boros. Uh, Dr. Boros is, uh, he has served as the Carter G. Woodson Distinguished Professor of Journalism at Marshall University, uh, Vice President for Academic Affairs at Cotton University College in, uh, Cotton University now in Swakoko, Liberia. Uh, Dr. Boros holds a BA in Journalism, cum laude, from uh, Howard University and an MA in communications from Syracuse University, a PhD in communications from Temple. He's written numerous books, uh, among them Between the Color Forest and the Salted Sea, A History of the Liberian People Before 1800. But today, today we're taking a look at this book, Liberia and the Quest for Freedom. Dr. Poros, hello and welcome. Thank you, Octavius. Uh... And um, I just want to, to greet your viewers as well. Glad to be here. And let's go into the book right away, uh, Dr. Boris. I like the idea that you begin the book with the concept of collective guilt. Excuse me. In the Liberian context, it gets even worse because what happens oftentimes is that because we are engaged in collective blame for the wrongdoing of individuals, we then tend to pursue the weak, the weakest members of that group are the ones who are persecuted and punished. And in the process of doing so, we allow the actual perpetrators to go free. Mm -hmm. So you, you also talk about the trans-Saharan slave trade, which a lot of us are aware of, uh, the transatlantic slave trade as well. And a lot of us are also aware of that, uh, the differences and similarities and all of that. But I want to, to zoom in on the role of the crop uh, sugar cane uh, and how that influenced or impacted the slave trade, not just in the trans Saharan slave trade, but also in the transatlantic slave trade as well. Yes, we have in West Africa the rise of empires that are involved in trading, and uh, in in the trade where goods from our area of Liberia, goods like Malagata spice, cola, nuts, um, and salt, are being traded across. West Africa. And um, so we're part of this international network. This attracts attention. M Malagata spice was being sold in Spain and Italy, for example. Uh, we know that because the records uh, have been preserved and they come down to us. And, uh, and so in the context of that international trade network, you begin to see Africans being captured and sold to across the Mediterranean and over to the what is called the Middle East, Arabia, and those places. The Arabs invaded North Africa about 700 uh, AD. And in the course of the invasion, the, the people who were captured and those people too were sent into this, um, this um, abyss, you know, into perpetual slavery in, in other parts away from West Africa. So um, this begins a traffic in captured Africans, Africans who are now taken into exile for a lifetime. Uh, as a result, if you watch CNN today and um, you, uh, the, you know, the coverage is on events in the Middle East, it's not unusual sometimes for you to see people of African descent, you know, sometimes serving as a spokesperson for one government or the other, you know, or you see people on the street and you'll see among them people of African descent. There are African descendant communities in Turkey, Iran, you know, Iraq, all of those areas, Saudi Arabia, all of those areas, Palestine, and so forth. Uh, and it came out of that... Um, the, the Trans-Sahara slave trade, the numbers that were removed are not that different from the numbers that will be removed later 
through the transatlantic slave trade. Europeans knew about Africans being captured and taken to the Middle East and in the Mediterranean. That was one of the attractions that brought them around the Cape, the West African Cape, down to our area and then to Ghana. They were looking to get their, um, to, 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 to get involved in this traffic of captured Africans. Uh, they wanted gold and they wanted Malagata spice, which came only from Liberia. Uh, one of the crops, as you mentioned, that was driving uh, the removal of Africans to the Middle East to work was this obscure plant called sugarcane. So from all indications, scientists say sugarcane originated in Asia and it was domesticated uh, in, um, in the area of India. And then, you know, it's a source of sugar. And that became an important attraction. So eventually, in the area around Lebanon, uh, sugarcane plantations were created, right? That was a new development. People would farm individual families growing, you know, a little bit of sugarcane. Many of us, when we're living in Liberia, we have one or two little sugarcane plants, you know, maybe near the house, or if the, yeah, your parents had a farm, there'll be some sugar cane there. When it's ready, you cut it, eat a little bit of it, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but the plantation took it to another level. And you had people working in swampy areas to grow this crop. And then it had to be, the sugar would be extracted by a very dangerous process of boiling down the juice so that you could get the crystals, you know, of sugar. People will get uh, burnt in the process, sometimes, you know, accidentally and so forth, um, lose their limbs or lose their lives. And so Africans would be put to the most dangerous work, and that was part of the the, the, the work, you know, that they were, they were brought to the Middle East to do. And so sugarcane spread from plantations, I should say, spread from um, the area of Lebanon. And... Uh, after Europeans, the Portuguese in particular, came to our region, uh, they then seized the Cape Verde Islands off the coast of Senegal. And they actually brought people from the mainland to be slaves there. And they then captured the islands of Angola, like Sao Tome and uh, Principe. Uh, and then they started plantations, you know, to grow sugarcane. When the, the transatlantic slave trade took off, you then had this plant transplanted to the Caribbean islands and places like Louisiana or in Florida. And then um, plantations were established and more Africans were brought to work those plantations. I know you talk about more Africans, but let's look at the numbers. The numbers were staggering. You had a total of what? 12.5 million between 1514 and 18, uh, 1866. Oh, yes. I mean, that's a, that's a current, you know, consensus among historians mm -hmm. that it was about 12.5 million people who were removed from Africa and, and you know, landed in um, the Americas. We're talking from Brazil all the way up, you know, to um, the coast of, of Canada. Very few up in, in the area of Canada, of course, but um, the Caribbean islands in uh, the southern United States, yes. But you see, it wasn't just the 12.5 million who landed successfully. Almost 2 million, mm. I mean, about 2 million, I should say, died when they were being brought from the interior, from the hinterlands of Africa to the coast. Because you see, the conditions were very harsh, and people were being kidnapped, and then they would be forced you know, to 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 move, to get to the coast where the European buyers were waiting. And in the course of their trek from wherever they were living down to the coast, it's estimated that 2 million people or so died. On the ships, conditions were so miserable 
then yeah, another one point something million people who died on those mm -hmm. ships. You follow? Mm -hmm. So the losses to Africa were staggering. I was going to also mention, uh, speaking of losses, that, uh, those who died working in the fields after they arrived in uh, the so-called New World, uh, the numerous people died as well uh, in those plantations. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a process where uh, Africans would be brought to the Caribbean and they, the slave masters would expose them to the harshest treatment. They call it seasoning, mm. right? Yeah. And then the, the idea was to break people in, to, to make them accommodate themselves to this inhumane experience, losing your sense of agency, you know, your sense of humanity. And after people were, quote, unquote, broken in or seasoned, then they'll be moved to the America, to the United States, to the British uh, North America. Uh, so it was systematic. And in that process of quote unquote seasoning, yeah, people mm -hmm. died, lots of people died. And if we look at the distribution, I think according to the book, you said Portugal accounted for 3.8 million. And of course, a lot of times when we're talking yes. about the slave trade, we, those of us who speak English, we look at the United States and the Caribbean and forget the fact that the traffic that went to Brazil primarily was more than that of the United States. Oh, yes. And uh, you see, and when we talk about uh, the numbers, mm -hmm. right, I encourage your viewers to take advantage of a really important resource, which is available online for free. And that resource is called uh, slavejourneys.org. It was compiled, it's a database, compiled by numerous scholars from around the world. And what they did was they, wherever they found records of, of slave trading, uh, of ships that were transporting you know, Africans to the Americas, mm -hmm. they inputted that data into the database. Uh, so you imagine people are tapping into the archives in France, in Holland, uh, Great Britain, you name it. Brazil, Cuba, all of it going into this one central database. So if you go to that database, you can see for yourself the hundreds of uh, ships that were removing people, you know, hundreds of people at a time. And it is very sophisticated. You can control with the filter exactly what dimensions of the trade you want to understand to see. Uh, you could say, Show me the people who were removed from the Windward Coast, which is our area. That was what Liberia was called back mm -hmm. then. Um, and, uh, and then it will show you over time how the traffic begins slowly, and then it builds. And you see the ships being removed across the Atlantic, you know, they're simulating the, the removal of people over the Atlantic. So that's a very important resource mm -hmm. that I recommend, you know, people um, can, can examine. For... Our context, the Windward Coast, the Windward Coast was not exactly the coast of Liberia. A, a little bit of it was uh, part of Sierra Leone, but not much. And a little bit of, of it also was part of Cote d'Ivoire. Mm -hmm. but, but mainly, it, the Windward Coast was Liberia. Uh, Liberians, we don't know our history, but we like to pretend that we do. You know, my mother used to tell me when I was in elementary school, a little learning is a dangerous thing. <laughs> <laughs> so she wanted you to drink, you know, deep. Don't just expose mm -hmm. yourself on the surface. And um, and so we hear people talking about, oh, Liberia was the Green Coast. It wasn't. Okay? The Green Coast extended all the way from Senegal coming down. It was wherever Africans grew rice, wherever the diet consisted, you know, of a staple that was rice. And that was broad. Liberia was not the pepper coast, although Malagueta was important and was removed from our area, but Malagueta only grew from River Sess to Kipamas. Mm -hmm. You follow? I so it's a was, small area. So we need to, 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 to use the language that really fits us. So the Windward Coast, the main uh, uh, 
power at the time that were removing people from the windward coast was the Netherlands, <clears throat> the Dutch. So after they were, they had built Elmina, the fortress in uh, Ghana, current day Ghana, and they were pushed out. Then they moved down to the windward coast to start removing captives. And if you look at the data, most of those who were removed from our area, including people from the southeast, mm -hmm. by the way, you know, we often hear in Liberia, they say, oh, uh, crew people are never yeah. enslaved. Uh, the reality is <laughs> many, many, many crew people were, were removed. And they went to Suriname. The Dutch controlled that. Uh, Guyana, which the Dutch originally controlled before the British took it. Uh, and then parts of the Caribbean, Jamaica, a major place where people from our area went, right? Barbados, a lot of our people went there. St. Kitts, so like that, uh, those were the main places. And then South Carolina in the United States, excuse me, South Carolina in the United States. And that was because at that point, the slave traders decided they wanted to feed Africans who were being brought on these slave ships with rice. They had been feeding people with cassava, with yam and edo and things like that. And those things go bad, you know You know that. It's hard yeah. to keep. Uh, and uh, But rice, if you don't put water on it, you can keep it indefinitely. So they started buying rice from the Africans who grew it to feed people on the ships. And later on, they said, but why are we paying these Africans for rice? We will capture or buy Africans who know how to grow rice and we'll put them in the swamps in America where they can grow the rice for us. And that was how our people got removed to the swamps of South Carolina and um, South Georgia, right? And uh, so two ethnic groups from our area were involved in the beginning, the Gizi and the Gola. And in America, they came to be known as the Gichi and Gala. And uh, so those communities, our ancestors were at the core of those black communities. In the, um, the other thing I want to talk about, Dr. Poros, is at this time is when we begin to see the emergence of racism, uh, not just as an ideology of racial supremacy, but as an ideology to justify criminal behavior in the slave trade. What we what we see in history is the um, development of certain ideologies that correspond with actual developments that are going on in society. You know, at those times, and when I say they correspond, I don't mean the ideology describes what is really happening. What it does is that it justifies what is happening. Do you follow? So. Um, if we look for anti-black ideologies, you see the earliest forms in um, Middle Eastern societies. You find, you know, stories among the Persians, among you know the Arabs, of of blacks being inferior. Uh, we're not human, so to speak. And it's as if the people who are engaged themselves in doing something that they know is wrong, they need to be able to justify it to themselves. In order to sleep at night, they say, we're doing it for their own mm. good, or we're doing it because they're not human, you know, they're not, they're not like us, they don't deserve the same treatment that we receive. So those ideas are then developed and you know, disseminated. And that was what happened in the West when the West became involved in this horrendous, uh, 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 you know, process of um, widespread enslavement of, of Africans. And um, so people are engaged in crimes against humanity, but then they're saying, well, no, they're not crimes against humanity because these people are not human. Mm. 
Now, I mean, as bad as all of that is, uh, let me say this to your audience, as bad as that is, there's something even worse. And what's worse is that once that ideology permeates the group that is targeted by it, and the members of that group begin to think along those lines, that is the worst tragedy mm -hmm. of all. And I would argue to your audience that part of why Liberians find it so hard to understand our history is because our history, our story is permeated by this anti-black thinking, by this, you know, white supremacist ideology. And we haven't even started the process of untangling it. What our internet, quote unquote, historians do, they go online and they find one book with somebody cussing Liberians, for example, uh, Jehudi Ashmo, whoever, say, hey, look, 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 look what the white man said about us. And that's good enough mm -hmm. for them. We go around talking about, quote unquote, country devil. That's the Portuguese who came up with that. Describing the masked, you know, ritual uh, dancers, right, from our traditional religion as devils. We internalize it. They said that African religion is nothing but superstition and it is demonic. And we say, oh, yeah, oh my goodness, it's demonic. But notice something. The Western view of Asian religions is different. Asian religions are dismissed, you know, as maybe illegitimate or exotic, but they are not demonized. You, people pay money now to go and, and learn how to do yoga, <laughs> which, you know, it's an extension yeah, of Hinduism, yes, yes. right? And uh, people show respect for Buddhism. Many people in the West, you know, convert to, to Buddhism or they say you can be Buddhist and Catholic at the same time, no problem. But with our religion, go to more, a lot of horror movies, you know, the zombie movies is based on demonizing African traditional religion. You know, the zombie movie, I mean, let's got, look at that word, zombie. <laughs> that, 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 that's what Fela was referring to, soldiers in Nigeria acting like, you know, people who don't have a mind of their own, they're controlled by some, the walking dead. That's that's our mythology. And they say, oh, that, that's how the African religion is. So, so we have internalized it and we have to, to criticize it's hold on us for us to get a hold of our true story is what I'm saying. And let's move on and talk about important international events at the time. Uh, you had, of course, the American War of Independence. You had the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution of 1794, and then Britain abolishes uh, slavery. Uh, you had our people who had been slaves fighting in some of these wars. Uh, and that informs the beginning of uh, some kind of resistance. But I want to go back, circle back to resistance against slavery as a whole. It really started with our own people on the continent from running away to yes. being, from, not, not, not wanting to be captured, so to speak. Yeah, so, you know, we, we, get, we have it backwards. And that's, I'm glad you asked this question now because it dovetails neatly with what I was saying before, when you internalize a view which holds an ideology, which holds, you know, you and your race and your group to be less than, you always see other people as the ones who are driving history. They're, they're acting and you are reacting. It's, history is being done to you. You're not doing history. You know, you're not performing, right, in the world. And, uh, and the point that you make is, is really critical here. You see, from the moment that people are making an effort to capture Africans, there was resistance. Let me be specific. I don't like to leave things, you know, in the air. Let's go to the Liberian experience in particular. When I published the Kola Forest book, and I was going on book tour, you know, uh, talking to people about the contents, a number of people come up to me and they will take the book and they say, uh, 
This book has um, Pedro de Centra in it, right? Uh, because one that was a, one of the few things they knew about our early history. And secondly, they saw the involvement of Pedro de Centra in our story as somehow legitimizing us. You follow me? And then if I had Pedro de Centra in the book, then maybe they would buy it. But if for any reason I left him out, then that book was not worth it. So let's take Pedro de Centra. Pedro de Centra was part of a, a chain sponsored by Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal. And he desi designed a process to try and get around his nemesis in Morocco. The Portuguese and the Moroccans have been at odds for some time, right across that um, channel. And uh, he, he decided, okay, he would devote effort to understanding shipbuilding, navigation as best he could. He himself was not a navigator, but he was spending money on shipbuilding technology, development of compass and what have you, anything that was related to uh, seafaring. That's how he got that label. So he told his navigators, I want you to go down the coast of Africa. Don't go far. Just, just go a little bit, and, but take careful notes and then come back and, uh, and tell us what you saw and collect anything that you can and bring it. And if you can capture anybody from there, bring them. And people started sneaking down the coast, go like the Canary Islands, turn around, go back. Go down, you know, to Senegal, you turn around and go back like that. And then that's how Pedro de Centra, using the notes, right, descriptions of the previous navigators, was able to go beyond them and reach to the area around Marshall, the Junk River. So when they got there, and mind you, live librarians don't know, it was the Portuguese who named many of the features of our land and our rivers, St. Paul, St. John, you follow? Uh, Kepalmas. So, Cestus, you know, River Cess. We can come back to that. But when he got to Marshall, that's where he said, you know what, let's turn around and go back. We've gone far enough. So he and his crew are sitting on the ship there, getting ready to turn. A kinu comes with three of our people. They reach the ship, and these men are so bold, they've never seen one of these ships before, to go on the ships. So they go up there, and according to Pedro de Centra's secretary, and scribe, who kept the notes, the Portuguese proceeded to seize one of the men to carry him back, as instructed by their sponsor, Prince Henry, and the other two men jump overboard, you know, into the ocean uh, and flee. For me, that experience, that particular story, it illustrates the story of Africans' experience with this transatlantic slave trade. For every one person that you're able to capture, you've got two others who are fleeing or doing whatever they can to escape uh, the clutches. And uh, so the resistance begins on the coast of Africa. Uh, a lot of our internet quote unquote historians, all they do is they draw upon whatever sources are available on the internet. If it's not free on the internet, they don't buy the book. You know what I mean? That's too much, that's too expensive. That They will not go into a library to do research. And what they will not do is to consider the oral traditions of our people as being legitimate sources of history. They don't know the, the oral tradition. You follow? And so they are here making these hell of our arguments, um, but they are not, not informed, not, not by the available sources. And so if you look at Gola oral traditions, oral history, there is a legendary um, uh, figure 
by the name of uh, uh, Vanja Vanja. And uh, basically it said that, you know, he, he was a very powerfully built man. Uh, he, the Gula were living much further north at the time in the Kumba mountain area. And he had traveled to the coast because people were hearing about, you know, the European travelers coming and trade goods coming. He went to go see for himself. What he saw horrified him. People were being captured and loaded onto these ships. So he hatched a plan. He told a friend of his, said, my man, tie me, but don't tie it too tight and carry me and sell me to these people. And they were glad to get somebody who looked strong and healthy and all. They put him on the ship with his acquiescence. And they said that he had studied the operation of these ships for, for a while before he did this. And so when he got on board, he immediately went for a dog that he kept to intimidate people. And he flipped the dog over the, the, the railings into the sea. And once he did that, he was able to attack the crew that had guns on board, on, on the deck. There were not that many, you know, with guns. They felt comfortable. They had been doing this for a while. So he overpowered them. And once he did that, he the, the people, the Africans who had been brought on board, they hadn't been secured yet. And uh, those people joined him now in overpowering the, the rest of the crew who had not been armed. So that entire intended cargo of people escaped thanks to the work of Vanja Vanja. And the Gola remembered him over hundreds of years. This, the oral tradition I'm talking about was collected, was recorded in the 1950s uh, because of his heroism. And part of the importance of this Torah is uh, to circle back and then look at ourselves as participants in the trade, uh, not necessarily to shame anyone, but to, to bring the story full circle. But before we come to Liberia, let's look at other parts of the of West Africa. We had slavery going on in uh, Senegal, the Senegal River, uh, Gambia, uh, Benin, and the Niger Delta in uh, Nigeria. It was a pretty extensive trade across the, 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 the western part of the continent, wasn't it? Very much so. In fact, it touched all parts of Africa, to be tru truthful to you. It touched all parts of Africa. But of course, you know, those were the areas that mm -hmm. were most dominant. You take a place like Angola, right? And um, in um, Liberia, we refer to people as Congo people. Uh, and that reference originally was to... Um, Africans who were liberated from slave ships and brought to Liberia. What many of us don't realize is the term Congo didn't apply exclusively to people from around the Congo River, what is now the Congo River, right? Spelt with a C. At that time, the, uh, there was an empire that was dominant in Angola which was called Congo with a K, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that's how it was rendered, mm -hmm. that's how it was spelt. So the idea of Congolese people was that there were people who could have been from Angola or they could have been from Congo Brazzaville or they could have been from Congo Kinshasa, you know, all people from that region, mm -hmm. like say Southwest, Southwestern Africa, so to speak, were considered Congolese. Um, and, um, so yeah, there were large numbers of people being taken from those places, but there were people being removed from South Africa, from East Africa as well. It was more expensive to do it. Uh, you know what I mean? And, but when Liberians say, how time make monkey eat pepper. And when, um, the slave traffickers were mm -hmm. under pressure, and they couldn't get people from one area to move to the other. There were actually people brought to the area of Liberia from Madagascar. So among those mm -hmm. recaptured Africans that once liberated from slave ships, there were people all the way from Madagascar. Uh, President Hillary Richard Wright Johnson's wife 
was reportedly from wow. that community. So let's, let's come to look at our area specifically now, which is the reason why we establishing the fact that the trade was widespread. Then let's come and look inward to ourselves now at Liberia. Cape Mount, it was a hotbed of the trade. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so you have, you have Cape Mount, the area around what is now Buchanan in Basa, and the area around Cape Mesurado, you know, in, in what is now Monrovia, were, were some key points of, you know, people being put on to these ships. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the involvement of people in the, in the traffic had to do with certain conditions, you know, being uh, available that made it made it uh, more possible, more likely to, to occur. Um, you didn't have natural harbors along the windward coast that, like you had in the, the Gulf of Benin or you know in certain other parts of West Africa. The ships come right close to the shore, and people be loaded on there. Around Ghana, there were natural harbors. So in our area, the coast is rocky. The the area is is shallow. You know near the the shore, and you can walk out to the sea. You know, in effect, the ships ships couldn't come into that sand. And so um, it wasn't until the 1950s that the area was dredged close to what is now Bush, Bush Island, right, for the Freeport to be constructed and ships could come. All right. So back then, what used to happen in our area was that people would be put into these long canoes made out of cotton trees, and they would be put in the bottom. Uh, the bottom would be covered over, and then the crew would sit on top of that and paddle out to the, the ships, and then the people would be taken from under the, the bottom of these big canoes, cotton tree, you know, canoes, and loaded onto these ships. Then the next, you know, people be making these trips back and forth. It was a very inefficient, uh, uh, expensive way of doing things, but that was the means that were available. Uh, so wherever you had the ability for the, that kind of a movement to take place, you know, uh, people took advantage of it. And it was a matter of greed. Uh, and uh, once some people assented to doing this, they would get weapons in exchange for the people that they captured and sold. And that meant then you got weapons, you now have a superiority to catch more people, and then that process would cycle on. You see, actually, during the, the transatlantic slave trade, Guns, European guns, were a currency in our region. Uh, I mean, people who think about this, people who know history, know that in the past, anything could have been used as currency, and many, many things were used as currency. It didn't have to be gold. It didn't have to be. It definitely wasn't paper at first. People originally would use items that were valuable as currency. So salt was currency, you know, silver was currency, right, tobacco. Uh, so you could, you could use it to trade, but then you could also convert it and, and, and consume it and, and make use of it. And guns were currency. And the, the currency involved, the general measurement was a good, strong, fit African man who was captured would be worth four guns, you follow? Then people will start from there and, and debate the buyer and the seller. And somebody will say, well, the man, he's got a soul. So I think I'll give you three guns, not four, and all of that. Or a woman with three guns instead of four, a child, maybe two or one, and, and so on. But guns were the currency. So you imagine the amount of guns that you know were flowing into our region and it just kept empowering the greedy ones who were willing to capture their own people and sell them.
So we've established that the trade is the, the trade is there, it's widespread, uh, and we're participating in it. And one interesting character arrives, who we mentioned in the book, Theophile Cano. Cano is a former French Italian convict. He's very fluent in several languages. He speaks English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Uh, tell us a little bit more about him and the role he played in making an already bad situation worse for our people. Kano is interesting uh, for many reasons. And um, one, of, one of the reasons is that um, he actually left a record, you know? This was someone who, he was literate, so he was able to write. But more than that, he was someone who um, saw his story as being interesting enough that people would want to read about it. And um, I don't know that he was actually ashamed of what he had done, right? So when he quit the slave trade, he was driven out. And he actually was from Europe, like you said, mixture of Italian and French. But when he quit the slave trade, he was driven out. He came to the U.S., to Baltimore, and it was in Baltimore that he used to go around bragging about his experience and stuff. And people said, but my man, you need to write about this. And he did. Hmm. So he wrote a book. So we have from him an insider's perspective on the story, from the perspective of one who was a buyer of African captives. Um, and he really doesn't mince words. I mean, he describes you know, some of the horror uh, uh, of, of the traffic. He describes the greed that was involved uh, on the part of many, including mm -hmm. himself. And so through him, we have a window that can allow us to see what it might have been, probably was, for other slave buyers, right? Um, and so he, he says he comes to the area originally of Rio Pongo, um, present-day Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, in that region, and um, he comes to make a fortune. He wants to, to take a chance, you know? The slave trade was seen as a place where great risk, but great opportunity. And he humbles himself to somebody who is experienced so he can learn the trade from Don Pedro Blanco. And, well, it wasn't Don okay. Pedro at first. Uh, in, in his first experience, yeah, he was apprenticing okay. himself to another European, you know, in, in that region. And they kept going, and he describes this man as uh, having been a drunk uh, and uh, somewhat um, unstable mentally. And, you know, that's, that's one of the consequences of being involved in this, in this traffic. Uh, takes a toll on you. And he said that the man had a harem of women, and he became suspicious that Kanu was engaged with one of them, and that's what spoiled their relationship. Um, Kanu at one point was arrested, taken to Europe, tried and imprisoned, and so he's removed from West Africa wow. temporarily. Regarding this man, uh, Kanu, I mentioned earlier that he actually, you know, wrote a memoir of his experiences on the on the West Coast, right? His involvement in the slave trade. Um, he mentions his earlier life, but the focus for him is the slave trade. Now, I wanted to use this moment to share with your audience the work that's required for people who take history seriously. Here are three of the many books that I have on Kanu, right? Now, these are not books that people have written about him. These are his books, so to speak. But these are different versions of the book. And one needs to consult these different versions to see what's what. Now, the first one that was published was 
not not this particular copy. This is a later, you know, edition, sort of, you know, of the the eighteen hundred uh, book that he did. But this book is the one that the public first saw with his name on it. Um, you'll notice that on the spine of this book, his name is spelled C A N O T. Because the book was published in English in America, and they were rendering it in a way that the Americans, you know, English-speaking people would, would understand. Okay, um, but the person who wrote this was a, a novelist, and people who had heard Kanu talking about his experience told him, "Say, my man." You need to talk to this guy. He has an interesting story, and you can write it up. You know, it will be dramatic. So he that's what he does. You follow me? All right. Then uh, in um, the 1920s, 30s, the Harlem Renaissance begins. Uh, there are black artists and black writers who are writing about Africa and so on. Someone comes out with a, another edition of Kanu's book. A different novelist. And if you look at the art, not just on the cover, but in the book itself, it has that feel of some of the art that emerged, you know, during the Harlem Renaissance. It was done by a very famous Latin American artist, but he was influenced by black artists, black American artists at the time. So this version and the one that I showed you are different in the content. The storyline is the same, but it's not word for word because they're two different editors, so to speak. Okay, this came out in the 1970s or so when um, you had a renewed interest now, the Black Consciousness Movement comes and uh, people are looking for our history and this book is published. And what it contains is the manuscript that Kanu had constructed before the editors got to it. So some things are in here that were left out of those books. You follow me? And here, notice the spelling of his name is in the original, you know, his European spelling, Theophilus rather than Theodore and, and Kanu in that rendering. So in order to write the story, you know, of our experience, I had to get as many of these books as I could find, the different editions, and then I ended up having to compare them because it, there's some things in his manuscript which the editors left out or things that the editors, you know, the way they, they phrase it is different from the way that it was in his manuscript. Uh, but people don't appreciate, you know, what goes on in the background. We just, somehow just grab one of these books and say, oh, yeah, yeah this is what happened, but without, you know, looking more deeply into it. And I'm hoping by sharing this, people develop a, a better appreciation for history. Yeah, okay, so Dr. One. Boris, thank you so much again, as always. And uh, look forward to mm, seeing you again you. in part two. Join us for part two, Liberia and the Quest for Freedom, a book by Dr. Carl Patrick Boris. See you next time.